We are marking today 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union and today in particular, December 8th, 1991, of course, was uh, the day that the um, Bela Virja Accords uh, were signed and effectively ending the existence of the USSR, although Mr. Gorbachev himself didn't actually leave the Kremlin until December 25th, 1991. And I'm told that you can almost see the scratch marks from his nails uh, as he held on to the door, um, not, not really wanting to leave and admit that the Soviet Union had collapsed. And of course, Boris Yeltsin moved into his office in the Kremlin, uh, and um, uh, we now have 15 <coughs> separate countries um, that were former republics of the Soviet Union. <coughs> the revolution of 1917 um, and um, the revolution of 1991 uh, really bookend the 20th century. They were landmark um, events. They were punctuation points, exclamation points even, um, in history. Ending one era and an almost complete break with the past and the hopeful introduction of new social, political, and economic orders that um, would hopefully, idealistically, uh, improve lives of the people occupying the Eurasian expanse. The big question is, did they? Uh, either 1917 or 1991. The Soviet experiment, of course, was driven by uh, ideology, by Marxism, Leninism. Um, it ran its course, collapsing ultimately in 1991. With some successes, uh, industrialization uh, of an agricultural peasant economy, but at tremendous human cost, and we'll hear about some of that, I know, uh, today. It devolved into terror uh, and totalitarianism under Stalin, and eventually stagnation under Brezhnev, only to collapse under Gorbachev's uneven, uneven and halting reforms. The official collapse, as I said, came with his exit from the Kremlin on December 25th, uh, 1991, after he appeared briefly on television to announce the dissolution of the Soviet Union once and for all. In the wake of that announcement, came opportunity for 15 new sovereign entities, including, of course, Ukraine, uh, our focus case, if you will. Uh, I'm a political scientist, so I have to say things like cases and causality and correlation. Um, from the perspective of 2021, there are at least three reform paths that the 15 republics of the Soviet Union pursued. One is a personalistic patronal autocracy a model of government now consolidated in Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, now Belarus, Tajikistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. I'm just going to shrug, I'm not sure what to call it. Uh, a second model, democracies in the Baltics, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, members of the European Union and NATO, and then models that are uh, struggling toward transition. And here I would put Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, perhaps foremost among them, um, struggling to be different, struggling um, to uh, themselves join Europe. Why uh, are there three different paths, at least three paths following 1991 is the subject of our workshop in many ways. Why were so many of the hopes of the moment uh, of December 1991 unrealized? Why did some democratize? Why do some continue to struggle to democratize? Um, some regress to regimes more repressive even uh, than the late Soviet Union. And finally, why today, as we sit here, are there somewhere between 100,000 to 175,000 Russian troops amassed on the Ukrainian border? I'm pretty sure 30 years ago today, absolutely none of us would have predicted that. Today we'll briefly revisit some of the events of 1991 with a special focus on the Ukrainian experience over the last three decades. Why Ukraine? Um, well, a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, Ukraine has stood out for its struggle for changes, the strength of its civil society, the tenacity of some of its leadership and citizens in the face of sometimes violent interference in its politics and economics by an overbearing, increasingly powerful and aggressive autocratic neighbor. Ukraine is, in political science terms, a critical case um, for theories of democratization. 
It is pretty much an average sized European country in terms of population and geography with a well-educated society, middle to lower income comparatively, um, that in many ways should have transited easily uh, to democracy. But it lives in a bad neighborhood uh, and it has a neighbor that is particularly interested in Ukraine not being a successful example to uh, its own people. And that is, of course, Putin's Russia. And I want to differentiate between Putin's regime and Russia, because they are not the same thing, despite his trying to fuse them. We at CDDRL have long had an investment in Ukraine uh, and Ukraine's success with work done by my predecessor as director, um, Francis Fukuyama, here in the corner, um, and by my colleague, Larry Diamond, um, and by Michael McFall, uh, sitting in the middle of the room. Um, our Knight Fellows program um, here at Stanford University more generally has a wonderful program bringing in journalists from Ukraine um, as well, uh, and so we have alumni there. Um, we have our own Ukrainian Emerging Leaders program um, here at CDDRL, and we have a commitment to bringing in Ukrainian emerging leaders in our program, uh, the Draper Hill Summer Fellows on Democracy and Development some of whom actually now work in the Ukrainian government or have sit in the Ukrainian parliament. Um, we are now hosting a former prime minister of Ukraine. That's not sure what that is exactly. Um, say the Russians. Yeah, <laughs> some of those tanks have made it over here. Um, we're now hosting, of course, as the Bernard and Leo Toad visiting fellow, um, former prime minister of Ukraine, Alexei Hancharuk who is really the mastermind of our workshop today. Um, and I, sh I was going to say partner in crime, but actually he's not. He's the leader in, in our crime today. Um, so I want to end by welcoming uh, our Ukrainian visitors and um, people who are online um, and thank my Stanford colleagues uh, for joining us. Um, I'm going to stop talking and hand the microphone over to uh, Alexei Hanchoruk. And as I mentioned, the Bernard and Leah Toad visiting fellow at FSI and CDDRL. Um, and also former Prime Minister of Ukraine. Alexei. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, for agreeing, first of all, uh, to organize this conference in a one and a half months, yeah? Yes. It sounds incredible. So thank you for your patience. Uh, it was a challenge, sometimes even maybe uh, uh, even more, but we did it and uh, it's already a good uh, start, I believe. Thank you, dear guests, for joining us uh, here in this hall and online all over the world. I hope this event will be fruitful and interesting for you. Today, um, when we decided, actually, when idea is was appeared, to organize this conference, uh, there were not uh, Russian troops along the borders of Ukraine. So the topic wasn't hot, but it was important. So this, this topic is not only hot, it's important now. That's why we have conference, this conference uh, here, and I believe Stanford University, FSI, CDDRL is a perfect place to raise really important issues. The 18th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union is a great occasion to look back and reflect on the lessons to be learned to reverse the negative trend of democracy we unfortunately have. I believe that collapse wasn't inevitable. I believe we shouldn't take it for granted. There were a lot of reasons, of course, for collapse. But the main reason was so-called national question. Because Soviet Union was a prison of nations. And that's why Ukrainians played a crucial role in ruining this empire of like evil, so-called. Today we want to show you in details how it happened and guide you through all this logic during this conference. We want to show you and to the world the unique role of Ukrainian, Belarus, and of course Russian and 
other people, thousands of people, uh, played in this historical event that divided the history of the world uh, before, to before and, and after. The Ukrainian's long fight for freedom was closely linked with the fight for democracy. Because for us, that was the only way how we saw the future of our independent country. 30 years ago, it seemed like we won all this battle. Like the world won its the biggest battle. But now, we can say that we didn't do our homework the way we should have. Not only in Ukraine, but in the whole world, the Western part of it, uh, first of all. Moreover, we are taking the existing state, the free world, for granted. And it is a huge mistake, I believe. And now we are paying a price for it. And 2021, this year, is the worst year for democracy for at least, I don't know, 15 years, maybe. And my sincere belief that this is not a crisis we are experiencing. It's a global war against democracy. And Ukraine has become its main battleground, battlefield now. So it's not a regional conflict we have. It's a global process, a global war, and that place, that region is only a main battlefield. And this is another important reason why we have this conference about collapse and Ukraine and all this very important story, I believe. So the years after the end of Cold War, we are once again talking about battlegrounds, front lines, but this time we believe that the many people here in the West still don't recognize the true state of things. That's why maybe it's very important to speak about it one more time. We believe that Russia inter uh, inherited not only United, uh, USSR uh, properties, but USSR values and mode of conduct. And each and every time, the Kremlin challenges Western democratic values and principles and turns it into a weapon against the West. Russia continues the ideological war, not for resources, not for territories, but for ideas. And their goal to undermine the democracy itself to destroy trust, to divide the people, and to create chaos. Ukraine is playing a special role in this war, and Putin attacked us only because of our choice, because Ukraine decided to be a democracy. And imperfect democracy, but still a democracy. And if you will look into a region, you will understand that it's already a huge success to be a democracy. I sincerely believe that Ukraine now is a part of solution, not a problem. And Ukrainians already proved that we are capable to be in a beacon of democracy in the region. And a very reliable partner for the West. These are messages, these are messages we want to share with you now during this conference. And uh, to make sure that you, our alliance, understand us in the right way. Because the strong democratic Ukraine, I believe, is the best answer to Russian global threat. And empowering Ukraine and democracy in the region in general, the West will empower the eastern front line of democratic world and can ruin the evil empire one more time and for all. 30 years ago, the West came so close to finally winning the Cold War, but failed to see Ukraine's ability to ruin the Soviet Union. 30 years ago, at the tipping point of the USSR collapse, the US leader, President of the United States, came to Kyiv with a chicken Kyiv speech. 
It was a big mistake, but Ukrainians fixed this mistake. And we ruined the empire back then, and we are fighting against the same empire now. And we need you to believe us, to believe in us, and help us, not on the old level of declaration. First of all, I speak to you Western elites. So, dear West, please don't chicken now this time. It's very important for our region and for like all the world, because the price we will pay next time will be much higher. I believe uh, this conference is very important to raise all these issues and to discuss it one more time. Uh, and I wanna, I'm happy to invite to this stage and to give a floor to one very brave Belarus man uh, who is a real fighter for freedom in, in Belarus, is a neighbor of Russia and Ukraine, and the person who really knows uh, what is the price of freedom because he was imprisoned uh, by Lukashenko regime. Uh, Vitaly, floor is yours. Thank you, guys, colleagues, for participating in this very important event. Over two decades have passed since the collapse of the communist system, yet there is still no consensus over the causes and the consequences of those events. In examining of Soviet collapse, there's a permanent search for interpretive framework. What exactly ended in 1991? We know that every revolution is a surprise. Still, the, late, the latest Russian revolution must be counted among the greatest surprises in history. In the years leading up to 1991, virtually no Western expert, scientist, official, or political leader foresaw the approaching collapse of Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me today in exploring and examining the why and how and what exactly happened at the end of Soviet period. I would love to introduce and um, ask to join me our wonderful panel, Marta Dishok. <laughs> Marta is Associate Professor at the Department of History and Political Science, Western University, please. She is a fellow at the University of Toronto School of Global Affairs and professor at the National University of Kyiv. Adjunct professor. Yeah. Professor specializes in international politics and history with a focus on East Central Europe and Eurasia, and specifically Ukraine. She has published five books, including Ukraine, 20 Years After Independence, Assessments, Perspective, Challenges. Our next distinguished guest is uh, wonderful Rose Eileen Godmuller. <laughs> who is an exceptional American diplomat who served as a that's true. <laughs> who served as a deputy secretary uh, secretary general of NATO. She became, by the way, the first female deputy secretary general. Ladies and gentlemen, this is <laughs> impressive. Ross was also Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. At the National Security Council in the White House, she also served as the Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia Affairs with responsibility for denuclearization in Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. Now, Ross is with Center of International Security and Cooperation at the Stanford University. Our next wonderful guest is Norman Neumark. Norman is an American historian. He is a professor of East 
Eastern European Studies at Stanford University. He's also senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and of the Institute of International Studies. He has served as a director of Stanford Center for Russian and East European Studies and as a chair of its history department. Our next distinguished guest is Sergei Plahi. Sergei is a professor of Ukraine history at Harvard University, where he also serves as a director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Thank you. Sergei is the author of numerous books, including The Last Empire, The Final Days of the Soviet Union, which received the Goldberg Prize for the best book on international relations. I will start with Marta, and Marta, we will start with a broad big picture and then zoom in, zoom out in the crisis and the collapse of Soviet Union. Um, the Biden administra administration has pledged to make support for democracy as a key part of U.S. foreign policy, raising hopes for a more proactive American role in reversing the global democratic decline. It is um, constantly declared Ukraine is an important U.S. ally in the region. Now. In 2008, we remember NATO promised Ukraine and Georgia that they would become members of the alliance. Today, 13 years later, the U.S. still can't live up to this pledge. Since April, the same, very same year, 2008, no American president has set foot on Ukrainian soil. No Senate-confirmed person has held the position of U.S. Amb ambassador to Ukraine since 2019, since uh, removal of Marie Ivanovich. Then in July, uh, in April, I believe, uh, U.S. reversed plans to deploy two destroyers to the Black Sea. And then in July, the administration dropped its effort to block completion of pipeline Nord Stream 2. Marta, are we seeing here a collapse of democratic promise. Uh, thank you. That's a wonderful introduction. It's great to be here. This is my first in-person event since the pandemic started. I'm speaking in a mask for the first time, so I hope you can hear me. This is a, a strange experience. I would like to start by thanking Oleksiy Huncharuk, Ukraine's former prime minister, for organizing this conference on this historic day. I'm actually a historian, so I'm going to go back into history and then look at your question. I woke up this morning in a hotel room in Palo Alto, and the first thing I did is I thought, what's going on in the world? Turn on the television and listen to what the latest on the Putin-Biden talks were. On this day 30 years ago, I woke up in a hotel room in Minsk and turned on the TV to see what was happening in the talks between Yeltsin, Karachuk, and Lukashenko. Because nobody knew what they had decided. The foreign press corps, I was a reporter for the, <coughs> excuse me, the Guardian at the time. We heard there was a meeting in, in Minsk, so we flew up there. Uh, we saw them take off at the airport, but we didn't know what they had decided. And of course, they made a historic decision, which was the final step in the collapse of the Soviet Union. The timing of this is important because this was right after Ukraine's referendum on independence. It's hard to believe 30 years have passed since these events. 30 years ago, I was a PhD student at Oxford working on my dissertation on World War II Ukrainian refugees. And I wanted to look at the archives in the Soviet Union because they were part of the Grand Alliance. I'd looked at American, British, and French archives. I was missing the Soviet. So I got myself on this Canada-Soviet academic exchange program, landed in the Soviet Union in March of 1991. That was a very exciting time in history. And I thought, OK, well, the archives, I started working in the archives. And there's a wonderful archivist in the audience here who is looking at archives that I was looking at way back then. <coughs> but history was unfolding around me. And I thought, the archives, they're not going anywhere. I want to see history. So I walked into the office of The Guardian in Moscow and offered them my services. I said, I'm going to be in Kyiv. You don't have anybody in Kyiv. Would you like me to report for you? And they said, John Retty, who was at the, in the office the day I walked in, he said, 
well, we'll try you. Because the story in Ukraine had started unfolding. And at the time, Western media didn't have permanent correspondents in the republics. They had Moscow bureaus, so all the news coming out of Ukraine and the Baltics and Georgia was all coming from the Moscow bureau. But by spring of 91, things had started moving to the point that they were thinking, we really need more people out there collecting information. And I was the lucky one who got the Guardian job. Uh, just to show you how lucky I was, a few months earlier, Susan Vietz, who had worked for The Guardian in Hungary, reporting on things, she went, she said, the story in Hungary is dying down. Things are starting to move in Ukraine. I'd like to move to Ukraine. And The Guardian said, oh, there's not enough of a story in Ukraine. So she went to The Independent. And The Independent said, yes, go. And she became the first foreign correspondent to permanently be based in Ukraine. After her, Bob Seeley came out for the Times. Marta Kulmej set up the Moscow, uh, the key, we, Ukrainian Weekly Bureau. And I walked into the Guardian. So the, there were four of us. And the entire foreign press corps could fit into one car. And we very often traveled together to press conferences and other events. So spring of 1991, what struck me and others, how little attention had been paid to what was going on in Ukraine that all the reporting was coming from Moscow. And that gives you a very different perspective. Because if you're not on the ground, you don't see the story unfolding. You just fly in for the big stories and you fly out. And what struck all of us was how even in Moscow, our bureaus didn't have a good understanding of what was going on in Ukraine. And very often I would call in a story to the Moscow bureau and I would get questioned. Are you sure they said independence? They really didn't understand how quickly things were already moving in Ukraine in spring, summer of 1991. So there was beginning of attention. And as there were more of us in cave, more journalists started coming. So by the summer, Christia Freeland came out to report for the Financial Times. Steve Mulvey came for the Telegraph. So the foreign press corps started growing. And of course, there were many of us there to witness the infamous speech by US President Bush uh, that has already been referred to. The, I can't remember which journalist coined that chicken cave title, but that person should get a note in, in history because they captured exactly what had happened. And by the way, that was the only time I saw Karachuk's wife because when Bush arrived at Buddhist Bilin Cave Airport, you know, George Bush comes out with Barbara. So Leonid Karachuk had to have his wife there, the only time we saw her. But in Parliament, the speech went down, as we all know, like a lead balloon. And the interesting thing was afterwards, again, as a journalist, you have to try to get commentary from people. So I walked up to Vyacheslav Chernovil, who was one of the leaders of Ruch, the uh, pro-independence movement, and asked him. And he said, well, it's very nice that the American president came to visit and gave us a nice speech, referred to Shuchanko, and talked about democracy. But we know what we're doing. And I think that's kind of the key to understanding what was happening in Ukraine then and what's happening in Ukraine now. That Ukrainians are open to advice and they are asking for help, but they ultimately will make their own decisions on what they choose to do. And what we saw in 1991 is despite being told by the American president, don't go for suicidal nationalism, i.e. don't go for independence, they did what they decided they wanted to do. And there's a series of documentary films that we'll be watching later. The scriptwriter is in the back, uh, the back row there at Alexander Zinchenko. He reminded me how precarious things were in 1991. We look back now and we see that Ukraine declared independence, um, the coup failed, there was a referendum, and so on. But back in August of 1991, things were extremely precarious. And it wasn't at all clear how things would unfold. And looking back at those events, again, with the help of these wonderful documentary films, I'm struck by how politically astute the elites were 
in Parliament, they were able to negotiate and come up with a solution that was quite phenomenal, frankly. Communist Party elites voting for Ukrainian independence. Leonid Kravchuk, former ideology chief, championing Ukrainian independence. If you think about it, that was an extremely courageous and the last documentary that looks at the Ukrainian referendum on, in December 1st, 1991, which leads to the meeting of Yeltsin, uh, Kravchuk and Shushkevich and the Belovesha Accords that we're commemorating today or marking today, um, they didn't know what the outcome would be. And there's a really poignant movie, a uh, moment in the documentary which I hadn't heard from before. Leonid Kravchuk, who had become president of Ukraine, he had led the Declaration of Independence, they had the successful referendum, he travels to Belarus, they sign this agreement that destroys the Soviet Union, he comes back to Ukraine and he is met by two military officials. And he describes this in the movie, sorry, this is a spoiler, that he has taken all these steps and he's walking down the hall and his, he's thinking, oh my God, they've come to arrest me. And that, hearing him say that, I didn't know that at the time, but he said this in these interviews that made it into the documentary, just shows how much courage it required because they didn't know what was going to happen. As we didn't know what was going to happen, not 30 years later, but in 2014, when we see another invasion coming from uh, the north. And the, the thing that I'm constantly thinking about is the mental maps that drive people's behavior. And the lack of understanding by Western political leaders and Russian political leaders about what was happening in Ukraine back in 1991, I think is partially explained by the mental maps that people have in their heads. That when Jonathan Steele was asking me, did they really go for independence? It's because he had been educated, he's a very well educated, highly intelligent man, but the history that he'd been taught was the Russian imperial historical narrative in which Ukraine is part of Russia. It's little Russia, it's South Russia, it's part of Russia's sphere of influence. So it was inconceivable to him and many others, I imagine Bush and I think uh, Sergei Pluhik wrote about this brilliantly in his book, that they just couldn't understand that Ukrainians are not Russians and they don't want to be part of a Russian political system. And it was hard for him to get that and it was interesting, he came down, Jonathan Steele, for the big story of the referendum, which was in December. So my job then was to be the fixer. Because I was just, you know, he's the bureau chief, I'm the junior correspondent. So I set up a whole bunch of interviews for him, one of which was with Leonid um, Plusht. He was the deputy speaker of parliament at the time. Jonathan wanted to speak with Krochuk. Krochuk was busy campaigning, so I set up the interview with Plusht. We walked into the meeting and um, it was Jonathan's interview, so I was just there. And they're talking about various things leading up to independence. At one point in the interview, Plusch turns to me and asks me something, a point of clarification. And then he turns back to Jonathan and continues the interview. As we were walking out of the interview, Jonathan turns to me and says, I now believe you. And I was thinking, what did Plusch say that confirmed something that I'd been saying? So I asked him and he said, well, I now believe you that Ukrainian and Russian are separate languages. And I was completely taken aback. And what he said is, I thought Plusht was speaking Ukrainian. Those of you who remember Plusht, he spoke Russian with a heavy Ukrainian accent. So Jonathan Steele thought that Plusht was speaking Ukrainian when in fact he was speaking Russian. And he said it was only when he turned to you and spoke a different language that I couldn't understand what was being said anymore, then I realized that these are separate languages because Plush spoke to me in Ukrainian because he knew me had been working there for a few months. So it was that experience that changed something in Jonathan Steele's mental map, that Ukrainians are not Russians, but he had to experience it like that. And I think these mental maps that people walk around with, in Ukraine 
in Moscow, in Washington, in, in Canada. Uh, that has changed over 30 years, but not completely. And when we look at events, you asked me about the present and I went back into the past, um, there are still people whose mental maps think that Ukraine is Russia's sphere of influence, so Putin does have the authority to actually say what he thinks Ukraine should do. Completely ignoring the fact that Ukrainians are the ones who choose what they want back in 1991 and in the present. And the media narratives that we're seeing about events in Ukraine now, for me, are striking that it's what Putin said, what Biden said. Very few people are reporting on what Zelensky is saying and what people in Ukraine are saying. And they are actually at the heart of this story. And they're once again being treated as an object rather than a subject. And I think that's where scholars, journalists, still have a lot of work to do to actually shift that. And I will stop at this point. Thank you well, very much. Martha, do, do, do I understand correctly that the United States um, did not foresee the collapse? Is it fair to say in this sense Absolutely. that uh, America did not want the collapse of Soviet Union? Well, they didn't want it, but they didn't foresee it. And I think that's partly the mental maps that I was talking about, that when you think about things in a certain way, that it's inconceivable to you that it could go differently. The fact that, again, in Sidi Pluhi's book, you know, demonstrates the Americans didn't want this to happen for reasons of global security, self-interest, etc. But I also think at some level they didn't think Ukraine's, Ukrainians would do it because they didn't really understand what was going on in Ukraine. And here I have to plug Canada, I'm Canadian, but in 1991 Canada I think was one of the countries that did get what was going on in Ukraine. And that was again for various reasons. It was partly to do with the fact that Roman Vashtuk, who couldn't <coughs> join us today, was a diplomat who was working in Moscow and in Ottawa writing a lot of really good briefs. And the fact that Canada actually was the first Western country to recognize Ukraine's independence in 91, that had a lot to do with the fact that there were people working in the diplomatic and political circles. And Brian Mulroney, who hardly ever gets mentioned, Bush gets mentioned all the time in this context, but he's the one who took the political decision that Canada would recognize Ukraine's independence the day after the referendum. Marta, say who he is. Who is? Say who he was. Brian Mulroney. Oh, sorry, I'm not in Canada. <laughs> Brian Mulroney was the pres Prime Minister of Canada, conservative political leader. Thank you. He well, took the political decision that Canada would recognize Ukraine's independence. And the United States waited until after Gorbachev resigned to do that. And for Ukraine, Canada's support at the time was crucial because remember, Lithuania had declared independence and nothing happened, right? So Ukraine declared independence, but without international recognition, they were really concerned if this would actually work, if it would have any sort of depth to it, or if it would just remain at a declaration level. But the United States eventually followed. So I don't want to be too critical. Well, well uh, let me connect, let, let me go straight. Uh, um, we'll come back to my first question because probably from uh, like choreography of the event, we'll do it later. But, but uh, let me connect to Ro Rose right away here. Um, Rose, um, I have a question to you connecting to, to what Marta said. Uh, do you think, um, did the, did the collapse of Soviet Union uh, mean the U.S. won the Cold War? Because from military point of view, there um, did not seem to be any side of uh, pre-revolutionary crisis in USSR back then, including the traditional cause of a state failure, external pressure. And talking about external pressure, of course, there was a Cold War, of course, um, the Afghanistan uh, increasingly looked like a long war, which um, wasn't a big problem for uh, USSR back then because five million strong Soviet military force um, losses were pretty negligible. So uh, was America the catalyzing force for the end of the Cold War and the collapse of Soviet empire? 
That's a great question. I've been rather impatient over the years at the triumphalist notion that we hear uh, sometimes that the United States somehow in an activist way won the Cold War. What Marta has to say and what we've been discussing and I think we will discuss is how actually um, the United States wasn't prepared for the, for the Soviet collapse, didn't see it coming, so to say. And I think there were other factors that drove the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union, many of them economic, many of them related to uh, the burden of trying to manage the national question, which I agree, it, it was not only uh, developing uh, a f uh, strongly in Ukraine, of course it was there, but also in Georgia, even in Kazakhstan. So there were many, many forces at work, but to say that the United States somehow was actively uh, winning the Cold War, I think is, uh, is a bit much. I think we need to reflect on all of those factors, many of them internal to the Soviet Union and the system that had developed there over the 70 years of Soviet power. If I may, I've been asked to comment on uh, the Soviet collapse providing a security perspective. And I have to say I'm a bit nonplussed being surrounded by historians who have uh, the ability to reflect in very wise ways uh, on uh, what has happened 30 years ago and indeed through the 70 years of Soviet power. But I do want to comment that uh, my work in the 1990s was very much focused on nuclear threat reduction. And it was meant to ensure that the Soviet collapse and the demise of the Soviet nuclear arsenal did not lead to fissile material or nuclear weapons falling into the wrong hands, either malign state actors uh, and proliferators or non-state actors, terrorist organizations. And here Ukraine was a great partner, working hard to help eliminate the Soviet force structure uh, of, uh, related to the nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon systems that remained on its territory. I know that denuclearization of Ukraine is controversial, but I want to stress here three points that I think uh, are important to reflect on. First, an attempt to transform Soviet nuclear ac assets into independent Ukrainian uh, nuclear deterrent forces would have condemned Ukraine to an outsider's status in the world community. Ukraine would not have received the status of a NATO aspirant at the Bucharest summit in 2008, for example. I will return to that point in a moment. Second, it would have exacerbated stability problems with the Russians rather than deterring them, not giving the young Ukrainian state the almost 25 years of breathing space that it had before the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014, crucial years in which the Ukrainian state actually did take shape and has take, continued to take shape despite this dreadful crisis imposed by the Russian invasion. And third, it would have been a tremendous economic drag on the young Ukrainian state at a time when resources were needed for many social welfare, manufacturing, and infrastructure purposes. The fair compensation that Ukraine received for the highly enriched uranium that came out of the nuclear weapons on its territory was instead a boost to the national budget and especially the national energy budget since it was down blended for nuclear power plant fuel and used in Ukraine. In addition, the major assistance programs to Ukraine from the United States and European Union countries had been a boost to Ukraine's economic fortunes that would not have occurred if Ukraine had insisted on a nuclear path. In other words, Ukraine has been better off working together with the United States, EU, and other Western partners than it would have been depending on uh, a nuclear deterrent force that had been cobbled together from the remains of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. I'm glad to discuss these points. I realize they are controversial, but I do think it is important to bear in mind that from the very outset, uh, the United States, driven frankly by this uh, notion of crisis with the, the breakup of the Soviet nuclear arsenal, the collapse of control over nuclear weapons and fissile material, but led to an intense and deep engagement with Ukraine from very early on. And I remember the diplomacy being conducted at a very high uh, and fast paced level. And I was very uh, interested at the level of sophistication and understanding and engagement of the Ukrainian diplomats who dove in 
to these negotiations from the very first moment. We can all recollect, of course, that they were uh, part of the uh, so-called, at the time, independent Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine uh, and had their role in the United Nations and in other settings, but at the same time, their training and their preparation was, was really uh, very, uh, I would say, positive and a very positive aspect in how we were able to conduct these successful negotiations. And I want to comment very briefly on the very rich partnership between NATO and Ukraine that has developed uh, over the years. It did not start immediately. It took some time to emerge. But um, I do want to say that there has been no change, no change whatsoever in NATO's Bucharest summit membership commitment to both Ukraine and Georgia once they have come up to NATO standards and NATO allies reach consensus on membership. Again, I realize that these are tough problems. Sometimes as NATO Deputy Secretary General, I was questioned about the standards and whether there were goalposts moving in both Ukraine and Georgia. I do not think that that is the case. I think both countries still have work to do, not only on the build, uh, building of their uh, military forces, but also on uh, addressing serious uh, governance problems internally, such as uh, problems of, of uh, corruption. And so uh, there are issues still to be addressed. I think there's still work to be done, but the commitment of the NATO alliance, I think, is strong and firm, and you can see it in the way in which there are very vigorous NATO presences in both Kyiv and Tbilisi and throughout the countries in, indeed. Um, uh, the other thing I would like to note uh, is that um, NATO enlargement is not a matter that can be governed by bilateral agreements such as what has been suggested by Russia, a bilateral agreement between uh, the United States and Russia or between NATO and Russia, legally binding guarantees, as Putin keeps demanding, for no further NATO enlargement into uh, Ukraine and Georgia. It was very interesting to me last night on the PBS NewsHour, a number of you might have seen her as well, but Victoria Newland pointed out yesterday on the NewsHour Enlargement of NATO is governed by the Washington Treaty of 1949, NATO's foundational document, which states that any European state that comes up to NATO standards and requests to join can be considered for membership as long as NATO countries agree. By these standards, Newland noted, this is not me, Newland noted that Russia itself could become a candidate for membership but I don't think we want to go there in this conference and discuss that. Um, I will just say once again, and I'm prepared to talk further, but I'm taking very seriously Marta's comment that we don't want to talk about what the interaction has been between Putin, Putin and Biden and the United States and Russia and Russia and NATO so much as we want to focus on Ukraine in this conference. But I do want to say that I think that Putin's demand for NATO assurances, uh, he's been saying they've only been usnia, they've only been ver verbal. That is not the case whatsoever. The NATO-Russia Founding Act and the Rome Declaration clearly state a number of firm assurances in both directions, from NATO to Russia, but also from Russia to NATO. And my arguments today in talking about this have been that we need to restore, renew, and re revivify those assurances and not try to wrestle with uh, issues like saying in a legally binding way that NATO should not enlarge any further. It is not possible. So perhaps I will end on that. Thank you. Ross, I, I want to just connect quickly here. You were mentioning um, the, the new START, the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, and you were at this time the chief negotiator. Um, and uh, we all know after the dissolution of Soviet Union, Ukraine held about um, one third of the Soviet nuclear arsenal and the third largest in the world at this time. So uh, now looking back, um, do you think Ukraine and the region in general were safer and better off in conflict with Russia if Ukraine didn't agree to destroy the weapons and uh, didn't agree to join the treaty of the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons? <laughs> 
My view is, and uh, the three points I made earlier indicate my view, but I, I will further underscore it by saying that uh, action by Ukraine, and it would have been a challenging both technical and also um, economic burden uh, to guillotine uh, the systems that were left in Ukraine, essentially part of a, a well-integrated network uh, of the Soviet nuclear, nuclear arsenal to guillotine that command and control system from Moscow, build it up independently, essentially take control of the weapon systems and ensure their continuing performance and maintenance, their effectiveness, so to say, would have been uh, an enormous uh, burden on Ukraine and it would have isolated Ukraine in a way that would not, in the end of the day, have been healthy for Ukraine's development as uh, an independent and sovereign state. So that is my continuing view. Again, as I said at the outset, I know it's a controversial view, but it is one that I feel uh, to this day is uh, important to reflect on, looking at all the factors that would have been necessary to wrestle with should Ukraine have chosen the different path. Thank you. Um, Norman, uh, I want to um, go with you a little bit deeper in the history and uh, ask you um, a question. The, you know, we see uh, certainly there were plenty of structural reasons, economic, political, social reasons for the collapse of Soviet Union and uh, it should be collapsed and it did collapse. But um, they all, in my opinion, uh, fail to explain uh, fully how it happened and when it happened. This is the point. So, was it Hungary in 1956 or Czechoslovakia 68, Poland in the 80s or uh, fall of Berlin Wall? Where does the Cold War end and where does the destruction of the empire start from your point of view? I don't have an easy answer. I think the, um, you know, when, when, uh, when I lived in the Soviet Union for quite a while in the mid-1970s, mid uh, uh, things looked pretty bad to me at the time, but they also lasted a very long time. Uh, after that. I mean, economically especially and socially. I mean, the ideology seemed hollowed out already by that time, Marxism-Leninism. Um, and so, you know, this process then is a slow, steady process that lasts, in my view, until uh, the 1980s when, you know, Gorbachev, who understands the, all of these processes, who sort of instinctively sees you know, what many people saw, which is the kind of hollowing out of this, of this edifice, and tried to do something about it, and found himself, you know, in a one-way street towards a dead end, and didn't know how to get off that, that path. I mean, so that's sort of how I would look at it. I mean, I agree with the uh, people who said earlier, you know, no one really expected the fall of the Soviet Union when it fell. I mean, no one expected the independence of Ukraine in 1991, after all, 30 years ago. I mean, what a, what a, a shocking, marvelous, in some ways, event. But, but it was hard to predict. And history moves sometimes <laughs> in mysterious ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would, I would suggest to you that, you know, that these contingencies sort of multiplied at the end of the 1980s, you know, to make this fall. Uh, come. It was going to happen at some point, but who knows at what point. Where, where is Ukraine here? So where do you think has Ukraine become a geopolitical flashpoint uh, uh, in a world politics? Was it just after a legitimate annexation of Crimea or before? I think it's, a, it's an all-Soviet problem. I mean, Ukraine is the biggest problem for the Soviet Union. It's the biggest problem for Moscow. It's the core. I mean, everybody points it out and says the same thing, and they're right, that there is no Russian empire without Ukraine. There is no, you know, there is no possibility uh, of, uh, I think Brzezinski puts it, there's no possibility of democracy and empire, you know, and democracy is at stake as well as we were speaking today. So, so in this context, I, I hear quite a lot uh, and quite often that Ukraine is a young, vibrant democracy in the heart of Europe. It's, it's, it's said quite often. So do you think it's correct in this, uh, correct to use this narrative uh, to, to call, to label Ukraine the, the youth or the young democracy while actually describing, uh, describing the establishment of uh, institutions in the country? So is it, uh, can we measure it by time? Is it fair to label the period of sovereignty as a, as a, um, 
practical uh, period of cooperation, actually. Is it really a young democracy? Is it uh, when the democracy becomes old from historian point of view? Why is uh, um, 30 years independent Ukraine a young democracy and uh, like uh, 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 not real democratic state yet? So is it? I mean, if, if you're asking me whether Ukraine is a democracy or not, again, there are people in this audience who are much more expert on, on sort of identifying what, it, what a democracy is and what it's not. In my view, it is a young democracy, as you put it. It's an aspiring democracy. I mean, Catherine noted that there were, in her introductory remarks, that it's sort of it's on the way, you know, and, and, and has some severe challenges uh, to meet in order to achieve a kind of you know, state where we can comfortably say uh, it's a democracy. But certainly, you know, in the context of what's happened with the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, uh, you know the Baltic states may be, you know, ahead in some senses. Um, uh, the East Europeans, you know, can, can e even if there's, there's you know, um, sort of retrogression, as it were, in Hungary and to a certain extent in Poland, um, you know, I think Ukraine is within that ballpark, as we would say. In other words, it, you know, if, if this damn threat from the East would not be there, I think we would have a good, you know, possible set of possibilities for Ukraine to achieve, you know, a high stage of democracy. Ukraine really does belong to Europe. I mean, it aspires to be a part of Europe, but historically it's part of Europe. In other words, it's not as if Ukraine is way out there somewhere. Sometimes I think the EU, especially, uh, NATO less so, you know, thinks of Ukraine as, you know, at the end of the earth, somewhere, you know, in Central Asia with wild people running around the, you know, uh, the steps on horseback. Um, you know, Ukraine's part of Europe. Its history is tied closely to Europe, to that of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, of course, in the 16th and 17th century, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Western Ukraine was part of uh, Poland in the interwar period, um, uh, you know, and suffered, as did the Baltic states, you know, the, the incorporation into the Soviet Union uh, uh, after World War II in a really violent way. You know, so Ukraine is, Ukraine is part of Europe. I mean, um, another part of my remarks, and I'll just sort of skip and jump, <laughs> using your questions as a way to do it, is, you know, a city like Lviv, which I visited um, uh, in uh, 1991, you know, was just a lively place, a European city um, in lots of different ways, but not just, you know, physically in terms of architecture or culturally in terms of its multi lingual and, and um, you know, kind of hip uh, European culture, um, but also in terms of its political sophistication, a lot of which came, of course, from across the border, meaning from Poland. You know, they're watching Polish television. It's a little bit like, you know, the East Germans were watching West German television saying, wait a minute, I want to live like that. I mean, people in, in Lviv understood exactly you know, what was going on and what went on in Poland. You know, the revolution, you know, the achievement of democracy, solidarity. I mean, all of these events, you know, were, were part of Lviv's uh, uh, history. And I think it's Serhi who said in his book at some point, you know, you can't think about the development of independent uh, Ukraine without thinking about Lviv and its crucial role really as a, as a kind of icebreaker in this Ukrainian um, you know, Soviet situation. It was, I mean, there was nothing Soviet about Lviv except for a, a, a superstructure. You know, the thing that surprised me too, I mean, I'm, again, I'm gonna jump and spin if you don't mind, um, is, uh, you know, I don't speak Ukrainian, but I speak Polish. You know, almost everybody spoke Polish. You know, almost everybody spoke Polish. I mean, it was a different kinds of Polish, different generations of Polish, you know, but, but it was, uh, you know, a truly multinational city with multinational outlook. And, and much of the impetus, you know, for the independence movement in Ukraine, you know, came out of Libya. It shifted to Kiev, you know, in 1990, probably a little bit with the, you know, foundations of Ruch and, and that sort of thing. And, the, and the, you know, the kind of independence movement uh, in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, the answer to your 
go back to the answer to your question, you know, Lviv, Ukraine, even, you know, even Eastern Ukraine, you know, is European. And, uh, and the desire to be part of Europe, um, you know, was crucial to the, to, you know, to the establishment of independence, um, to the, the closeness with the Poles, which was something I was going to, to mention. You know, they wanted to kind of follow the Poles. You know, the Poles were clearly marching towards NATO and towards the European Union, and the Ukrainians already in 91, they're saying, this is what we want. You know, this is what we want and what we hope uh, to gain. Thank you. I agree, I agree. Uh, that's why I have a problem to see. On the one hand, of course, it's an uh, independent state for the 30 years, but, but to see Ukraine as a young democracy with this rich history and European connection, and particularly in the western part of Ukraine, I, I, I totally agree. It's, uh, Sergei, Sergei um, I, I want to go to you and uh, ask you a quick um, question, but the question will refer to your book. Uh, I had the opportunity yesterday to look in it. Um, and um, the Russian President Vladimir Putin, speaking in uh, November uh, 2019, I believe, argued that the collapse of uh, Soviet Union, of uh, USSR, had little to do with the uh, growth of nationalism in the Baltic countries, like, like uh, Norman just mentioned. Instead, according to the Russian leader, this dramatic outcome resulted from uh, um, in efficient economic policy in the USSR. The first president of independent Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk, uh, though argues that the USSR was a, an um, artificial entity, uh, was an entity um, where republics were uh, with different histories, mentalities, and cultures were held together by the force of oppression. So what is it? Economic crisis, mortal nationalism, or leadership betrayal? Uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks to uh, colleagues here at Stanford for really uh, becoming leaders in engaging with Ukraine and with um, younger generation of Ukrainian politicians. So clearly uh, we at Harvard have a long tradition, it's mostly humanities. We are trying now to establish ourselves as a junior partner to a degree of Stanford. So it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, mm, uh, in terms of the question itself, uh, again, uh, economy is a very important part of the equation and it would be absolutely wrong to remove it from it. But the economy has its limits in explaining what happened in the post-Soviet space. Economy doesn't explain why um, Chechnya is part of, the, of Russia today. It doesn't explain why Ukraine, which was really closely connected to Russia in terms of the military, industrial uh, structures and so on and so forth, is an independent country. So you can't exclude your economy, but you have, you have to look at uh, different aspects as well. And that brings me back where, where we started with democracy. Uh, mm, a, a lot was said, again, that 30 years ago we, of course, envisioned the future of democracy in the region differently. This is absolutely true, and there is a lot of disappointments, and especially given the developments in the last maybe five to ten years. But going all the way back, 30 or maybe 35 years, there is no question in my mind that we are better off in terms of the democracy in that region without the Soviet Union. So uh, um, today on the post-Soviet space we have some of the um, most wonderful and vibrant democracies in the region looking for example at the Baltic states that are um, withstanding much more pressures from the, from the possible authoritarian tendencies than their neighbors, Poland or Hungary for example. And Ukraine is, of course, uh, part of that, of that story of the uh, democratic, democratic development. Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, and Martha was talking about that, is very closely connected to Ukraine. Ukrainians, uh, uh, in, in their referendum, the question for the referendum was not whether you want to dissolve the Soviet Union. The question was whether you want Ukraine to be independent. 
But once 90% of Ukrainians or more than that said that they wanted their country to be independent, the Soviet Union fell within one week. So the question that the way how the Ukrainians answered that question, they answered that question for Belarusians, they answered it for Russians, they un answered it for Kazakhs and, and, and many others. And uh, uh, in that sense, again, uh, Ukraine is central for the, uh, as Norman was saying, for the entire Soviet story. Once the empire loses Poland, Ukraine becomes the main headache. And Ukraine continues to be central for today's Russian attempts to reestablish itself on the post-Soviet space as a, as, a, as a dominant force and control that space. Now, um, the fall of the Soviet Union as an empire, and I look at it as an empire, it died the death of an empire falling along this um, uh, ethnic and, and, and national and, and, and other lines associated with that. So the fall of the Soviet Union would be impossible to imagine without democratization reforms of Gorbachev. And what it turned out that actually democracy and authoritarian multi-ethnic state, they don't go together very well. And uh, again, this is, this is the story of the Soviet collapse. This is the story also of, the, of Ukraine's Ukraine's rise to independence. Uh, Lviv and, and Western Ukraine. Well, this is part of the belt of the most troublesome belt for the late Soviet Union in the late 1980s, which I call the, Rob the Molotov Ribbentrop Europe. <coughs> so that was the part of the, of the uh, Soviet Union that was uh, 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 incorporated and but not fully integrated into the empire, and that's where the disintegration started. Uh, with, all, with all respect to the development in the Caucasus, with all respect to ethnic, ethnic conflicts in other regions, it was Estonia that put forward the idea of the economic sovereignty, it was Lithuania that put, was the first to declare its independence, and it's Ukrainian, uh, in the, uh, Ukrainian um, vote for independence that ended the Soviet Union. And again, Ukraine not entirely, not all of Ukraine is part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Europe, but significant part was, and that's, that's where a lot of developments were taking place. Um, mm, uh, if, I, if I can comment on the, on the issues that uh, were, raised, uh, were raised on de denuclearization, because I think it's, it, it is extremely important part of the story, story for the entire post-Soviet space and for the Ukrainian independence in particular. Uh, Ukraine, uh, unlike Kazakhstan and Belarus, really uh, fought for, for not per se for, the, uh, for staying nuclear, but certainly for a certain uh, better deal that it could get from the United States and from Russia. So others didn't fight. Eventually, Ukraine was pressured into, into giving up nuclear weapons on the conditions which were not certainly ideal. The Budapest Memorandum turned out to be, to be a very problematic document. Again, the Budapest Memorandum is there only because Ukraine resisted. Uh, without that resistance, there would be no other document that applies to Ukraine, to Belarus, to Kazakhstan, and so on and so forth. But all of that being said, I absolutely agree with the argument that actually at that point that was in Ukraine's national interest to give up nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, because the, 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 the nuclear weapons, like any other weapons, they're about achieving certain political objectives and goals. And Ukraine's goal and political objective was actually to become an independent country and to be recognized as such. We see another story in the early 90s of the giving up of the nuclear weapons that come from South Africa, where they're giving up uh, nuclear weapons actually for the same reasons, to be accepted by the international communities not to be pariah. Uh, what, what certainly can be questioned in a sense of uh, whether Ukraine actually was able to get the, the, right, the right type of uh, 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 um, assurances or whatever it is, or, or, or something, something in return that would preclude the 2014. Again, uh, in the early 90s, one of the ideas that was flooded for a while was the issue of NATO membership as, as the way actually to, to convince Ukraine to give up the weapons. Uh, Ukraine was not ready for that f for a number of reasons. So again, it, it was, the, the idea was there, but it wasn't, it wasn't let's say, Poland. Uh, 
So uh, um, with, with uh, uh, giving up nuclear weapons, Ukraine actually uh, established itself uh, as, as an uh, independent country. It established and created foundation for the future cooperation with the United States and the West, which is critically important today. Uh, so again, I, I think that uh, uh, mm, again one can talk about Ukraine playing car cards maybe better, or the U.S. taking a different stand, or Russia taking a different stand. But I think it's it's basically it was a step toward the ultimate goal of Ukraine happening as an independent state, because the fall of the Soviet Union was declared in 1991, but its disintegration only started in December of 1991. In the 1990s, Putin in his uh, Crimea speech says that we all in Moscow believed that Commonwealth of Independent States would be a new form of the joint, uh, uh, joint statehood. And he's not lying in that particular case. So what we see is actually that's, that's, that's we can see from, from memoirs, from, from uh, comments that were made at that time. And whether the Commonwealth would become a new uh, confederation of sorts led by Russia or not, that was decided in the 1990s and the nuclear weapons were right in the middle of these key issues and decisions and again having the United States on, on Ukraine's side was, was extremely important. And uh, um, uh, finally a few, few words about Ukrainian democracy and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, uh, Ukraine uh, um, uh, has been surrounded um, uh, in terms of its tough neighborhood by the states with the, which with the exception of the western neighbors uh, after flirting with democracy in the early 1990s became forms of uh, autocratic regime and again political scientists can correct me and, and give the, the right label uh, for those regimes. And there were two, at least two attempts in Ukraine to become normal in that sense, normal in terms of the environment that it is in. And one was, of course, the uh, uh, Orange Revolution around, before the Orange Revolution, the, the, the Kuchma regime. And the second one was uh, with Yanukovych. Again, Yanukovych played an important role both in 2004 and then in 2013. And both of those attempts actually were defeated by the, by the internal re revolt. Uh, not uh, uh, by, by the fact that too many people read books about what is democracy or believe that it was important to be democratic, but because the society actually didn't imagine function in any other way. There is a long story to that, historical and otherwise, but in that sense, again, the, the, the uh, war w which we have today, it maybe can so uh, sound cliché, but beyond this cliche, actually, some fundamental issues about the, the war being, among other things, also about the choosing a particular, particular form of governance, because again, Ukraine uh, is there, not trying to portray that we are for democracy and making it up, because uh, Ukraine needs the support of the United States, the kind of the uh, mim mimicry that was happening during the Cold War, that, okay, we are, we are ideologically close to you, so help us. Ukraine was there certainly before, before that war, so it, it, it is very serious for that country. It's, it's, it's the way how the country was born, that's the way how the country functions. Thank you. So you, you just mentioned Belarus. I, um, someone who's been fighting for Belarusian independence and uh, freedom and democracy, I hope one day uh, I have to ask you a question about Belarus. Uh, you just said when we talk about the fall of Soviet Union in 90s, um, 91, we usually start, we generally start with Baltics, right? And there is Ukraine um, that really made the existence of Soviet empire impossible. What role play Belarus in the whole uh, Eastern European and Soviet story? Um. Well, uh, Marta started with, with events exactly 30 years ago, in December of 1991. And uh, uh, the um, Belarusians, and, and the, the whole thing happened in Belarus, uh, mm, against expectations of Belarusian leadership. <laughs> so they, they, they certainly didn't know what, what, what was going to happen, what was going to transpire. 
but they position themselves uh, at that point as someone who can talk actually to both countries, to Russia and Ukraine. And at that time, Yeltsin's and Kravchuk's relations were already quite tense. So that was kind of a neutral ground, a foundation for what would later become as Minsk, Minsk, Minsk process and so on and so forth. So that idea was there already uh, early on. And uh, once the uh, Belarusian leadership heard what was going on, that the Soviet Union was about to be dissolved, the, the head of the, Ukra uh, of the Belarusian KGB first called Moscow and then told, told, told their own bosses in, in Belarus that that was happened. So that they, they didn't know what really to do. Eventually, they had a short meeting and decided, whatever happens, the union or no union, we stick to Russia. We stick to Russia for very specific reasons. There was oil and gas. The winter was coming. The, the Yeltsin's visit was important for Belarusians to negotiate how to survive the winter. Um, and uh, uh, that's that's basically where where it started. That uh, Belarus was uh, mm, uh, was offered independence without expecting that that offer would come was faced with the, with the uh, uh, need to become independent, given what happened in relations between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, Belarus is a very interesting case from my perspective in a sense that that is the only post-Soviet republic where the, the leadership uh, refused to uh, go the way of kind of forming a na nation state or nationalizing, at least in cultural terms, linguistic terms, in terms of history and historical narrative. But by refusing to do that, when all other neighbors actually jumped on the project of the, on the bandwagon of the nation state, Belarus uh, became much more different from Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and its neighborhood than, in a, than it ever was before 1991. So again, the, in, in, my, in my opinion, the, the, the forces of history, this global tendency toward creation of a nation state was working in Belarus despite, despite the wishes of, of uh, the political elite and uh, political elite represented by Lukashenko. And we now, we now see actually that uh, the, the, those, the, those forces are, are, are there. And again, it's very interesting that, uh, again, you, you can correct me, but looking at the developments of the last year, that the, 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 the um, demonstrations, the, the demands, they, they come with the demands of democracy. Uh, but one way or another, they become also linked to the issues of nation, uh, nationhood, national identity. And, and again, uh, it's, it's uh, y y your heart really, uh, hurts when, when you see what is what is going on there but also there are certain things that as a historian you recognize and and uh, realize that well that's that's probably what is what is happening thank you thank you so beautiful i'm really yeah. glad you raised this point because Sergio, you went to 94 but let's go back to 1991 belarus was actually very democratic in 1991 and in some ways it was ahead of ukraine and i think Ukraine has been understudied, but Belarus has been super understudied because that shift away from democracy in Belarus, I think, has not been properly studied because we forget 1991, Belarus was ahead of Ukraine in some ways in terms of the pro-democracy movement. And it's not First until... Parliament, Belarusian parliament. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were taking steps. And I'm not an expert on Belarus. I just remember thinking, Ruh is behind the popular front movement in Belarus in many ways on language, on culture, on all sorts of democratic principles, and then it veers off. And it's that sort of period 91 to 94 that I would like to learn more about. So if somebody's looking for a PhD dissertation topic, this is what you can do. Sorry to jump in there. Unfortunately, Belarus is now ahead again, but in authoritarian, in other way, yeah. I will uh, be running slowly out of time. I, I just want to ask last quick questions that he and then open up for um, uh, audience. Uh, um, okay, and the uh, Zoom uh, questions. But the last question that I want to ask you today is um, when we think about this time, uh, we ultimately think about Mikhail Gorbachev and Perestroika. And uh, we know that um, 
Perestroika created um, different capacities for uh, former USSR republics. And I was always wondering uh, why were the new institutions, um, the new reforms created by Gorbachev reforms, unable to co-op elites in support of his ambitious goals? Because on the beginning we felt like it's going to happen and, and we all, all 15 republics had the capacity to do it nationally, but it didn't work out. Why? Get the the elites on his on his side in that sense. Um, uh, that is despite the fact that his reforms were quite moderate. Just elites in Ukraine, or uh, well, uh, elites in Ukraine in particular. So um, um, Marta was talking about uh, the the Popular Front in Belarus being earlier there than Ruch was there. The Ruch was behind because Ukraine had this um, very well-established and formidable um, pyramid of the, of the political leadership under, um, under Sherbitsky that was insulated from the influences from Moscow since the 1950s, since Khrushchev came to power and then Brezhnev, they had, they had their fiefdom there. They were really, really very strong in terms of the, as, as a party elite, stronger than party elite probably in any other republic. And in that sense, they were able to uh, resist these reforms or call for reforms that were coming from Moscow longer than any other party leadership. And uh, certainly the, the, the failure to get, to get Ukrainian elite on, on board is one of the of the reasons for that, and uh, uh, they they felt disenfranchised uh, once uh, Gorbachev started to bring people from Ural Mountains like Yeltsin and and Rishkov and others. So the the interest of Ukrainian elite in the Soviet experiment, where they didn't have access anymore to the high office in Moscow, uh, diminished diminished dramatically. And if you look at the Ukrainian independence, and I'll finish here, and th that's, that's where, where the, the film also is very, very important and tells the story that was not told before by anybody, is the way how the uh, communist majority in the Ukrainian parliament on August 24th, 1991, decided actually to support independence. Because when Bush was with uh, Chicken Kiev in, 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 in Kiev, the communist majority applauded him. So that was the audience that actually took his message very well. But, but then they, they changed their mind, and they changed their mind on the second day after, after Yeltsin's decision to suspend the activities of the Communist Party in Russia, in the Russian Federation. So that was the final, the, the final blow, but again, the separation from Moscow really started on the day when uh, Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev was buried near the Kremlin wall. The, 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 from that point of view, the story of the Soviet collapse starts there. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have just 10 minutes left. Um, and uh, I just want to ask you, first of all, to say big thank you to Marta, to Rose, to Norman, and Zahi, and uh, open up for your question. And I believe we have also a Zoom question, please. Mr. McFall. Fantastic panel. My name is Michael McFall. I teach political science here at Stanford. I run FSI and I'm at the Hoover. Um, I just gave a talk in, in Tbilisi last week on the very same topic, uh, talking about causes of democracy and autocracy in the post-communist uh, world. So I, I reviewed that literature and I want to ask a question from the academic literature, including some things I've written 20 years ago. In fact, I just, to keep me honest, I just went and printed out what I wrote 20 years ago. So I'm not revisionist history <laughs> in year 2021. But uh, as, as, as many of you know, there's a big debate about causes of democracy versus autocracy based on structural, historical, socioeconomic forces versus actors and agents and, and people, right? Uh, I'm, a sitting right, I'm standing right in front of Larry Diamond. Uh, he knows this debate a lot better than I do. But in 2001, uh, as an experiment, social scientists simplify everything, like Catherine said. Uh, I wrote an article where what I said, the argument was, first elections matter a lot in terms of democracy or not. 
and there's a bigger literature, which I won't take our time on, but breakthrough elections, right? So what I did is I coded 1989 elections and 1990 election, right? So the Supreme Soviets for all the republics. By the way, I just looked it up. The communists won 83% of the vote in Belarus in 1990. And what I did is if you were over 60%, I predicted there'll be democracy down the road. If you are below, so below 60%, which is 40%, or let me, let me rephrase it, 60% for the communists, you will be locked in for autocracy for a long time. And then there was a middle ground, and, and I have them right here, Moldova, Russia, Ukraine, right in the middle, 20 years ago I published this, which said they're, they're going to struggle to consolidate democracy because there's not societal agreement about the democratic rules of the game. And, and as I look at this now, up in the top quadrant is Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, etc., Poland. Down in the autocracies, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. And in the middle, I got one wrong. Russia's in the middle. Russia's an autocracy today. We can talk about that another day. But in the, in the middle is still Ukraine. And I'm wondering today, 30 years later, 20 years after I published this piece, is, the, is it the case uh, that, that domestic politics and the balance of power and semi-autocracies, as we wrote, wrote about them in 2004 in Ukraine, I wrote that about Ukraine before the Orange Revolution, and then Viktor Yanukovych, his regime was also not a liberal democracy, and, and does that suggest there hasn't been as much uh, consolidation, or did that change after 2014? And now there's a kind of, because of your neighborhood, uh, Catherine said the neighborhood's really bad for democracy, and I agree with that, but maybe was that a, a moment that then created a kind of unity around the democratic rules of the game in Ukraine? I remember reading your articles, thank you. I'm wondering what you're working on now. Um, <laughs> democracy, this is really what we're talking about here today, and Oleksii Hunchuruk, he's the one who underscored it. Um, the United States had a president called Donald Trump recently. And um, as a Canadian, I was very concerned about what was happening in democracy here in the United States. Um, sometimes it seems to me that looking at democracy in Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, really should be expanded to be more global and not just looking at the neighborhood, but looking at it sort of internationally. The Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. That's, that's, that's why we exist. And yet, the, the Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union is analyzed as a unit, right? We're not looking at Ukraine compared to France, compared to the United States. We're looking at Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, and that sort of thing. So um, that's the only thick comment I wanted to make on that point. And yes, I, I, I read your work, so I know it, but I just still sometimes feel like the regional context needs to be broadened a little bit. And we have issues in Canada as well, so I'm not being anti-American here. But in terms of those issues, that's where I'll leave it. Thanks. No, we move forward. We have a couple more questions, I see. I, I can comment if, sure, if, briefly. if, if shortly. Uh, well, uh, again, I'm a historian, so I believe in, in the importance of historical um, uh, um, factors. Uh, so I, I don't think that something particularly happened in the, last, in the last 20 years. I think the issue is really uh, uh, Ukrainian regionalism. And when you look at the forms of mobilization, anti-Soviet mobilization in the late 1980s, you see different patterns. You see in Western Ukraine and Lviv, the pattern that you see in the Baltics. And you look at the Donbass, and this is basically the workers' movement and strike movement like you have in Kuzbass, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, mobilization of intelligentsia as well. So from that point of view, Ukraine is a combination of different, different historical kind of trends which makes it very difficult to establish authoritarian regime of a place like that. Going back to Belarus, the difference between the former interwar Western Belarus and uh, 
and uh, Central and Eastern uh, Belarus is not m m negligible, it exists, but it is not as pronounced uh, as, as in case of Ukraine, which the, the important factor is certainly Austria-Hungary, which was not part of, of Belarusian history. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hello, my name is Miroslav Gungadze. Um, I um, would like to, uh, talking about Ukraine and Europe, I would like to remind just very famous words by Voltaire, who said that Ukraine is the European lands unknown to Europe. And since then, uh, Europeans still, for two, three hundred years, still learning what is Ukraine. And actually, it's, it's and the United States as well, and the Western world. Uh, my question, uh, though, related to um, Ukrainian inspiration, NATO inspiration. I know we don't want to talk about Russian aggression right now. We will be talking about it a lot in the next panel, but since we have a <laughs> rose here. So 2008 uh, and decision made by uh, NATO allies not to give Ukraine a membership action plan. Was that... Uh, mistake or was that a right thing to do and do you think that led to more aggressive behavior of russia at later uh, time and even uh, war in georgia and ukraine thanks i think the answer to that is no and indeed uh, aspirants to nato membership have very little very different uh, uh, status with regard to membership action plans, and it has to do partially, I'm in a way speaking as former Deputy Secretary General here, but it has in a way, I think, to do with NATO not having uh, some regularized procedures with regard to the membership action plan. Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, which in my view uh, has as far to go as Ukraine and maybe even farther at the present moment, has a membership action plan but Ukraine and Georgia do not. So it's a kind of accident of NATO history, I think, without regularized procedures for membership action plans. But I do not attribute to the membership action plan the same kind of deterrence force, for example, that I know a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in the region attribute to it. I just don't think it has that kind of effect. And indeed, the deeply intertwined relationship between NATO and Ukraine today is, in my view, much more powerful than a membership action plan uh, would be. It has, in fact, inherent in uh, the kind of work program that NATO and Ukraine have together, it has many of the aspects of a membership action plan already ingrained. And essentially, they are pushing Ukraine forward toward, inexorably, in my view, toward eventual NATO membership. So to my mind, this fuss over a membership action plan is overstated. But I expect that Kiev will continue to demand it as uh, some kind of a next step to show that, that NATO actually loves Ukraine. <laughs> but I think NATO does plenty uh, to convey uh, maybe not um, love in a romantic sense, but uh, nevertheless, but commitment. And that commitment is to Ukraine's uh, formation as a fully capable independent democracy. Hi, uh, thank you for a brilliant interest uh, conversation. My name is Andriy Kohut. I'm a visiting scholar and Chris at Stanford University, and basically I am director of Ukrainian Security Service Archive. So it's those archive that uh, preserve uh, KGB uh, records in uh, Ukraine. And I have uh, questions regarding to the uh, nuclear, but not, not nuclear weapons, but about Chernobyl nuclear plant and disaster of Chernobyl nuclear, nuclear plant. Can we recognize uh, this uh, disaster like an important factor in the collapse of Soviet Union, in process of collapse of Soviet Union? Because uh, when we read the KGB reports and documents, it looks like when in Moscow happened perestroika, glasnost, and so on, in Soviet Ukraine happened nothing. But when happens uh, Chernobyl disasters, it starts a lot of... Uh, influence in the local uh, level and uh, start maybe uh, growth for the mass protest or mass opposition to Soviet power. So question, if we can recognize a Chernobyl nuclear disasters like an important factor in Soviet Union collapse. Thanks. Thank you. 
Sergey, do you want to take this question? I believe that's uh, uh, Sergey wrote a book yeah. about Chernobyl. I believe it's um, the right uh, person. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, thank you very much, Andre, for what you and your colleagues are doing in Kyiv with the uh, uh, former uh, Ukrainian KGB archive. This is the biggest, the largest um, open KGB archive in the world. And uh, from my own experience, it's actually very easy to work there, easier than in not secret, or formally secret archives uh, uh, anywhere in the post-Soviet space. So thank you, thank you for doing that. And also, uh, thank you for publishing those two volumes on Chernobyl in particular. I, I downloaded it and I worked with them, actually I worked last week with those. Um, mm, uh, Chernobyl is, in, in, at least in my reading, is extremely important part of the Soviet collapse. Uh, because the uh, mass mobilization, something that uh, Beisinger wrote a book about, excellent book in my, in my opinion, uh, starts in the Soviet Union with the uh, Chernobyl and mobilization, uh, anti-nuclear and ecological mobilization. There is another wonderful book on eco-nationalism in the late Soviet Union. Uh, the uh, origins of Soyuz, the, the um, mm, uh, Lithuanian Popular Front, and Lithuania is important because this is the first republic that declared independence from the Soviet Union, are in anti-nuclear mobilization around the Ignalina nuclear power plant where the HBO miniseries on Chernobyl were shot. Uh, the, the first mass in 1988 public rally in Kyiv in Ukraine ever, it's about Chernobyl. So that's something that hit everybody, that created a form of solidarity that crossed the ethnic, the, the, the party lines and other lines and brought people to the streets. And the regime itself actually was not able to say no because they felt that that was that, 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 was that and then the issues of religion have become the first semi-legal semi reasons for mass mobilizations and rallies. And uh, out of that came Saudis, out of that came Ruch, out of those mobilizations and again uh, the, the role of Lithuania and Ukraine in the fall of the Soviet Union are enormous. So again, uh, it's not to say that okay, the Soviet Union would be here without Chernobyl, but uh, if you talk about the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, not seeing the, the origins of that mobilization, mass mobilization in Chernobyl is big, big omission. Thank you. Um. Any questions? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask one question that I started this conference, this panel with, uh, with Marta, and I want to ask every um, panelist to briefly answer and to give his or her statement about this particular um, um, view of a collapse, as I frame it, uh, collapse of democratic promise. So talking about Ukraine in this um, um, in this field, uh, are we seeing here really a collapse of democratic promise, uh, I'm wondering, or are we just a little bit impatient with Ukraine, so we need more time? So uh, we have seen, uh, on the one hand, a kind of a um, proactive American role in uh, re-establishing of uh, global uh, democracy, on the one hand, and a lot of uh, arguments and rhetoric about Ukraine being a uh, prime example of a uh, democratic fight in the region. On the flip side, we have seen as well that for um, 13 years uh, there's still no um, membership. There's, uh, uh, there has been for 13 years uh, any U.S. president visiting Ukraine. We haven't seen um, a deployment of destroyers to Black Sea or the finishing of the pipeline. So I was wondering on the beginning, uh, with all this in mind, are we seeing here a collapse of democratic promise, and particularly in terms of Ukraine, or uh, specifically in, UK, in case of Ukraine, or are we just impatient in our desire for Ukraine to succeed? There's a lot in that question, right? Because you're asking two different things. You're asking whether you know, there's a collapse of democratic promise in Ukraine, and is there a collapse of international slash Western support for Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. Those are two very different issues. Um, the first issue, I would say, 
I, I don't feel that there is a collapse of democracy in Ukraine. In fact, I'm constantly surprised how Ukraine's democracy continues to rebound. It has been a trajectory that's been like this, but every time there's a threat to democracy, there's a response to it. Uh, the fact that there continues to be threats, that is worrying, but that's, I think, the mental maps that I was talking about. People still think in terms of authoritarianism. There's a competition, so I think Ukraine will be fine. It's 30 years. It's not a lot of time, as you know, Sidney says. It's, it's history. This, is, this has been a very short period of time for democracy to evolve internationally. Um, I think democracy, as Oleksii pointed out at the beginning, there's a lot of questions about what the democratic world is doing and what the response is. We're looking at Ukraine-Russia here. What is the response of the democratic world to international aggression? And it's not very optimistic. So that is of concern to me. Um, to what degree there is a responsibility to respond to international threats? If we go back to 1945 and the creation of the international liberal order that we've all been very comfortable with, it is disintegrating in front of us. And that is of concern to me. And um, it's not just about the United States, it's about Russia, it's about China, it's about the rules-based order being not respected as it once used to be. And who's taking a leadership role here? I don't see anybody, and that is of concern to me. It's a good point. I, I always point out that, uh, just imagine uh, 1938, and uh, after all what happened to Czechoslovakia, Austria first, uh, Czech, mm -hmm. Poland, and uh, we would come up like today and uh, set up um, sanctions for uh, 10 years up to 48 um, to punish the regime of uh, or the German uh, fascism in order to respond to this aggressive behavior. It seems like a nonsense, but this is a different story. Norman, what do you think to this question? Um, I've worked in a, uh, on a couple of projects having to do with um, uh, museums in Ukraine. Um, uh, historical museums, and one of the things one notices is that history, you know, that, that the history of the country is being written in some ways. I mean, it's been written before, it's been written by some very good historians, but, but a kind of consensus notion of what the country is, and it's a very diverse country with lots of different parts and lots of different moving parts, you know, to try to put together a national narrative is actually a quite difficult thing to do in and of itself. So, you know, m I, I feel very confident about uh, the future of Ukraine um, and the future of democracy in Ukraine, but this factor, again, of constant Russian pressure, you know, creates, uh, creates dysfunctional aspects within um, uh, uh, Ukraine that, that um, you know, rather than bring it together, help tear it apart. So, you know, the, the real trick, and here I agree uh, with my colleague, you know, is to try to figure out a way that the West and those who are responding to the crises and to this pressure, you know, can, um, you know, can, can come to some kind of consensus that would, would help them and help the Russians in some ways re remove this pressure that is constantly on Ukraine. You know? Thank you. And uh, so that's a little bit how I think about it. Thank you. Rose, so he, my any remarks, comments? My remarks are very similar to um, Norm's, and so I would just say, and I very much agree with, with Marta's remark that it is an international pressure, an international problem that we are seeing a disintegration of a rules-based order in the entire international system, threats to democracy on a, on a global basis. But in the face of that, I do see and I agree that there's a resilience of, of Ukrainian uh, society and uh, the Ukrainian governing system to external meddling. It has to do with the vibrancy of civil society somewhat. It has to do with the Ukrainian leadership determination, I think, in, in another sense. But um, how much 
backsliding we have seen from time to time in the corruption fight. Again, I'm taking you back to my remarks about preparing Ukraine for NATO membership, the kind of back and forth on how really determined Ukraine is going to be to fight corruption worries me uh, because uh, it is related to Russian meddling and uh, Russia will be unrelenting in its meddling. So my mega question is, how resilient will Ukraine be in the face of Russian meddling that is preventing it from achieving some of its objectives, some of its goals? And are there other things that we on the outside can and should be doing to join with Ukraine to bolster its resilience against this meddling? And uh, so perhaps that's a question we can address in our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we ran out of time. Um, I just want to say finally, um, it's been an honor to be here to join this wonderful panel with amazing experts. And I want you to join me uh, in a warm round of applause for Marta and Norman and Rose and Siri and uh, of course, uh, former Prime Minister um, and uh, Stanford University. Thank you so much.